Um, does it show up as me recording? Yes. Cool. So we are very clear that as doulas, we're not, you know, medical health providers like midwives, but the information that we get here can help us inform our care for our clients. So some of it is very basic, like, you know, I'm having leg cramps. Okay, well, have some bananas. Or my gums are bleeding. Try a softer brush or brush. Like some of those things are very simple. And then there are other pieces that it helps us, you know, also, let's say, um, if they have a history that they are willing to disclose with us about sexual trauma or um, health issues that helps us um, inform our care um, in terms of being mindfulness around touch, around those kind of things. And then there's other pieces where then it helps us to like make sure that our clients in touch with their doctors and that they're getting the care that are their midwives or their health care providers, that they're getting that care when they maybe didn't take something as serious enough to get care for. So we're not using it because we are <laughs> the medical care providers, but just as a tool of information. And the other piece that's really important is that um, we do this, we don't just give this to them to fill out. That's maybe even kind of uh, one of the biggest pieces. We don't give this to them to fill out. We give it, um, we read out the questions and then they, and then we record their answers. So it's a conversation. We do it that way, and I'm going to, you know, let any of you all add to this that has, you've done this before. But we do it this way, um, in my mind, it helps build a relationship. It helps um, start that conversation and around topics that sometimes can be hard to bring up or hard to talk about. You're having this initial conversation, and it kind of breaks the ice. And it builds trust and it builds a relationship when you are asking these questions out loud when someone tells you something that happened that was really challenging and you get to show empathy for them for your clients and then they get to see how like okay this is someone i can, I can trust this is someone that cares for me this is someone that does know how to empathize things like that are really important um, any, uh, Priscilla, Jocelyn, Kathleen, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, I would just add that, you know, depending on who, how you're doing it, something that I always got a lot, get a lot out of is just having a sense if, if the person has a partner or a support person with them, you can kind of get a sense of like, if, if they're a couple or if they're platonic, but what is this relationship's like comfort level? Like, do they know, do, like, do they know each other's medical history really well? Do they know about each other's families? Um, is, is this birthing person comfortable talking about, like I had an STD 10 years ago, things like that in front of their current partner, is that open or, and I can't say it's been frequent where like, I mean, I wouldn't know if someone lied to me, but like usually there's some knowledge, but sometimes the family like learns something new about each other, about their sibling, about their family history. So that's always a piece too, because I'm kind of watching, and this is what Samsara passed to me. Like I'm also noticing like, is the partner volunteering information and like engaged with the birthing person's health history and that? And then some, or like, is it the, like, does the birthing person like not remember any of her details and her partner knows them for her? Like just, it's just interesting to serving the unit as well as the individual. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else want to add to that? Um, I'll just, you know, say that's definitely something that I've observed also. And it's a really useful way of having conversations about things that you know it's a very kind of direct way of having conversations about difficult topics without like pointing out something to them or you you're like this is what we do with everyone and this is a midwifery model of care 
Um, and I'm not a medical, <laughs> medical provider. Um, and, and there's a lot to be learned even from asking, you know, somebody's address because then you find out, do they reside, you know, does the birthing person reside with somebody else or do they reside with their partner or their support person? Um, and even in that, you know, there, there can be a lot of information. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I've had a few times people come away with realizations about themselves and maybe work that they need to do on themselves, unresolved work for their birth because of the medical health history form. And again, that isn't about any kind of medical treatment for them, but it is certainly about that emotional work that they want to do or the realizations they come to and the work that they're going to do just from filling this out. Sometimes this has been the most powerful session that I've had with a client. Can I add one more thing to that? Yeah. Um, if you have a client who is their second baby or your second time working with them, you still want to do this. Um, like I, and I just thought of that when you said that Mika, because I'm working with a second time mom, it's my second time supporting this family. And what I did is I took her former health history and then I went through the information again and had a different color pen and like added the updated information because her health has changed in the last two years and she's had new symptoms and new challenges and it was this huge shining light on like oh she hasn't been taking as great care of herself because now she has a toddler <laughs> um so don't shy away from doing it even if you're already familiar with the person like be firm because i almost like didn't do the whole health history i was like no i'm gonna do the whole health history with them and i'm so glad i did um yeah priscilla yeah um also i just recently had this inspiration where i did the intake form and i was like okay now we're moving on to the everything else um and then like in the middle of like two three uh prenatals later something that was mentioned in the intake form came came back up but it was mentioned in a different context and i'm like oh you know like it was like um for example, like I had a seizure during um, my the birth of my first child. And then like the next time we're talking, it's like, well, I had a seizure and then I went to the hospital and then I found out I was pregnant, you know? So then that was like, look, that's not what I was told the first time. Um, so I had to, I had to plan on maybe redoing the intake form or just kind of going over the, the intake form again and just getting some of the information right this time um and that is if that comes up it's not it's not you shouldn't be scared to ask to redo it um because it's important you need to get everything right as much as you can anyway <laughs> so. so let's go over this form a little bit there you are. So there's a basic personal information. Um, this piece about drug allergies, man, let me tell you, this is important too, because I've also had it where they've written on their birth plan that they have, you know, a sensitivity to penicillin, let's say in their medical history file and I've had nurses still accidentally start administering penicillin and that being an alert for myself because I know that about my client is like oh we need to stop this now <laughs> right um, um, we go over the menstrual history um, Nowadays, a lot of people are adding that information into like an app on their phone. And so they have kind of easier access to do that. Um, 
And when we're talking about a, a cycle, um, we're talking about the cycle, the first day of your period, all the way until the day before your next period starts. That's a full cycle. It's often, I don't know, 27 to 29 days, but it could be different for different people, right? But when we're talking about cycle, we're not just talking about how many days you bleed, that full cycle. Um, and I don't know if anybody, let's see. And then we ask questions about obstetrical history. If someone tells you that they've had an, let's say an ectopic pregnancy or miscarriages, that is a time when you pause Mommy. and you in whatever way makes sense for you. Mommy. Sweetie, I'm in the middle of the meeting. I know. Okay, Mama, keep it. Okay, she can get it for you. Um, that's when you know you you don't just like check it off and move on. You don't have to be like a clinician, right? You get to pause, you get to empathize with them, you get to ask them um, how they're feeling, how they're feeling about that. You get to say, I'm you know, I'm so sorry to do that, or whatever it is that feels right for you to say at that moment. Um, it's one thing that also sometimes comes up for people, especially when they've had some kind of loss in their current pregnancy and birth. It can be issues about like fear around the birth, fear around losing their baby. Those things can come up. And so this is a time when we find these things out that we can offer some kind of closing ceremony or um, some kind of closure to support them through help move on to this current pregnancy and birth. They're getting ready. To um, move this up um, there's, if they've had previous births, um, you can record that information here. And then we get into medical history. So I would let them know that I'm going to read off a list of medical conditions and if they've had any of them to say yes. So I'd read those off um, and if they've had them, I would check it off and then I would record any notes or details about that and that might be helpful for me to know. Um, these are conditions and concerns that are not necessarily related to pregnancy. Um, questions. There's questions about genetics, like, um, and they're looking for specific blood disorders that many people have done uh, genetic testing for. But if that comes up and they haven't done genetic testing and they want to or they didn't know about it, you know, it's something that would come up like that for them. <clears throat> This is where this form looks a little different than I think the one that Samsara uses. Like this, the order of pages, the order of questions. Um, we ask how many times the pregnant person's mother has been pregnant and how many children she has, um, how long her labor was for, uh, because we know that you hold uh, mem muscle memory of your birth right, or not even muscle memory, but physical memory of your birth in your body, and all of that, it's in your cells, right? Um, and so you hold that in your body, and it, it comes up, comes up at your, during your birth. And so when we know those stories, we, we can find out if there are things that we need to support our clients with. Did they have, a, was their own birth traumatic? Were they a C-section baby? Were, um, were they born at home? You know, was their mom's labors fast or really long? What number were they? What was their, if this is, their, this is your client's first baby, what was their mom's first baby, birth like? 
I know my first, my first labor was almost exactly like my mom's first labor with me. <clears throat> Except that she was in a hospital and never went home. But in terms of like length and things that happened. Um, so we ask those questions. And then it's really nice also what's not on here, um, but what is nice to ask is how the uh, partner or partner's birth is like. Um, because they're going to come also to the birth with their own stuff. So if they had a great birth experience, or their birth was great, their birth was traumatic. If anything, they're going to come to their, the birth of their child with that too. Um, and so if there are things that need to be worked out ahead of time, you get to do that by, by asking those questions. Hmm. And then, you know, also, yeah, Kathleen. I was just going to say, asking about the, their mom's birth experience like their parents' birth experience with them or their, like that person's first child, the parent's first child, if it's their first child is really, really important, especially if they, their parent had a very fast mm -hmm. precipitous labor. Um, our client who delivered in her driveway um, delivered almost identical to the amount of time her mom had um it was very fast <laughs> it was very fast so it's it's really useful to know that ahead of time yeah just really it's really useful <laughs> totally that was one of our clients too that kathleen and you she almost she almost had her baby in the in the hall in that building <laughs> she did she almost did <laughs> so yeah mm-hmm Jessalyn? Um, I was going to say the other two questions that sometimes come from this. One is, um, not without going into like a whole lesson, if, if you get one of those like, I almost died because the cord was around my neck kind of story. It's like a lot of time, either the mom or the birthing person or the partner has like, they might not say like, I'm afraid of birth, but they have this like inaccurate, potentially inaccurate like story about their own birth. And it's always like a really nice opportunity to like remind folks of like how different their experience can be given that they have all this information and the support and this education um, or just like, you know, leaning into like what Mika said, like stories around the birth, but it can also be a really big educational oh, yeah. moment. Um, and then I had another point, but my brain is tired and I forgot it. It comes back. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, this one also is cool. It asks, like, what have girlfriends or female relatives told you about birth? Um, which I think is really um, informative. And sometimes that just comes up generally in conversation. Um, but uh, one, thing, <laughs> one thing that Samsara says that I, was, that I think is really, really true is that, like, culturally we we hypnotize each other about our our thoughts around birth like we tell women it's the most awful thing it's so painful it's scary it's this and that and so then you start believing that and then it happens and then and like you you literally hypnotize into this belief around what birth is is going to be for you um and i I vividly remember her mentioning that and um, with this client who's so shocked she did not have a c-section because every one of her friends had a c-section had a traumatic birth and even though my like I thought wow she had a lot of interventions in her birth she was like that was that was wild and amazing oh my god because it didn't turn out how everyone told me it was going to turn out right so that question, and, and there was so much work prenatally, even get her into the place where she, she felt like she could even just have a vaginal birth because of what people are telling her. I think Priscilla had something, and then I also remembered my other <laughs> yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. Go ahead, Priscilla. So I was thinking about the part about, you know, family history of mom's births and stuff like that. Um, 
I've, when you get like a client who is like, I'm adopted or I don't know, you know, stuff like that. Like how, I'm just curious to hear how you ladies um, proceed with that with, cause I don't know. I don't, I don't want to be a, oh, okay, well then this doesn't concern you, you know, <laughs> like I, I mean, I tend to ask, oh, okay, so what was your upbringing like, you know, do you know anything about your adopted family, something, just, just to at least also help me get a sense of what your adopted family has told you about birth, but also not to dismiss the fact that your family is still a family and not just because that you don't have your biological parent with you so we're just going to skip a whole area of your life you know so I'm just curious to hear I don't know if anybody kind of attacks that or if anybody has had that situation and how they attacked it I'll answer because it was part of my thing that I forgot okay. so I think what you just said is like a really lovely way to respond to that like affirming that family is family and offering that there might be value to either getting information or if they have information, sharing information about their biological family. But um, that was, a that that's like, I think that's such a beautiful opportunity to just address, you know, everyone makes their own family and their own family culture and while some of what we get is genetic, we also get the opportunity to recreate ourselves at every moment and with the choices we make, like hiring a doula. So I always find that to be like a really affirming moment. And what I remembered was if they don't know about their birth story, whether it's the situation you described or maybe just don't have a great relationship with the person who gave birth to them or whatever, that's an opportunity for me to say, like, are you interested in exploring that? Like, I encourage you to find out more about your birth, but you don't have to, but it, it, you know, what our stories, including the, ne the negative, the challenging, the paradoxical parts, the positive parts, the, the things that are tricky, the things that hurt, those are still our stories and, and informing ourselves about what we come from and where we come from gives us more agency in deciding how to navigate forward. So I always encourage them to get more information if that's on the table. And then if it's not, um, particularly in cases of adoption, I definitely like to recommend like PACT having resources or maybe if they're not in the area, but in the Bay Area, PACT is one of those organizations that has resources and, and community for either other birthing people who were adopted or people who are going to be placing a child for adoption. Um, so it's, I think it's like a really beautiful point of connection and establishing trust and just affirming the person's choices and their decision to work with you in the first place. <laughs> Sorry, it's getting really dark in here. <laughs> yeah, no, everything you said, I, I agree with. And huh? Everything you said. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um. And I think a bit of also what we're getting to is that piece about like, what, what are your beliefs around birth? What do you hold true around that? Um, a little bit more about that too. <clears throat> and then also, you know what? I like to ask this question about weight at birth because there's so much drama that comes up around your baby's too small, your baby's too big at the end of pregnancy, when oftentimes it, they're, you know, their babies or what is too large or too small fits within what is normal for that family, what is part of the norm. And so even like paying, really paying close attention to that when that might come up later on is um, helpful. So then the next set of questions are really about like gynecological and contraceptive history. And this is like, if ever any of these items have come up. Um, different, so there are different items that might impact the current pregnancy differently. Um, and I don't know how much <laughs> we want to get into all of that, um, but 
it's all very, it's, it's important and helpful to know. And if something comes up that you're unsure of, or, um, you know, you can always reach out to one of the, one of the senior doulas to Sansara, um, for some guidance or, um, but things like having a leak procedure sometimes causes some scar tissue on the cervix. Um, and it's good to know that because sometimes dilation, it can happen a little slower, let's say. Or there might be a piece of the cervix that has a little harder time dilating. But it might be, and if, you, you know, if your client has a midwife, you can ask them to talk about is there an appropriate time um, to use certain oils that might be helpful in breaking up some of that scar tissue, like primrose oil, um, things like that. Um, but you want to be very cautious around anything that you, we don't offer anything internally, right? So it's like, oh, ask your midwife about this. Okay. Um, but when we know that, we can have them go speak to their providers about something that might be helpful for them in a particular time. Because using primrose oil has prostaglandins in it. You would not want to use that earlier on in your pregnancy because it could cause preterm labor, <laughs> right? Um, so those kind of things are important to know. Um, and then we ask about birth control. And if it, our clients have had any complications or how that's gone, gone for them. Um, anyone want to add anything about kind of the obstetrics, gynecological history? Is this, oh, you, it just has to have a breast exam. Do you ever offer to demonstrate if they're not familiar, I mean, yeah, I'm I've sorry. never seen some Sara demonstrate breast exam. I usually say, are you familiar with how to do it? And they'll say either yes or no. I say, do you ever do it? And they'll say like, not enough. And I'll say, well, if you want to do a private demonstration at our next appointment, we can like step into the other room and I can show you on myself, but I highly recommend it lying down or in the shower. And you, it's good to do it because it's, practicing and if they're having a daughter I'm like you're already practicing self-care for your daughter it's good to remind her I don't know if people do it but I offer <laughs> Samsara always offers a, um an app that she uses and oh. she's like there's this great app I'll text you the link to it it's free it'll remind you nice do it how to do it um, what time of the month to do it and she loops in like all of this very positive information yeah <laughs> totally memorized yeah. nice i didn't know there was an app now yeah there's an app and it is what one, one of the benefits of of doing it kind of throughout pregnancy and immediate postpartum is that your breasts change a lot and mm -hmm. get, there's all kinds of lumps and stuff in there and Getting familiar with that changing breast helps you uh, know if there are any changes that are really, that feel abnormal and outside of that, mm -hmm. what, is, what is normal for change. Um, yeah. I think she uses it as a moment also to, uh, like to talk about that and also like to promote breastfeeding because then you reduce your... Mm. Your breast cancer. <laughs> breast cancer. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. And then we ask about the current pregnancy. Um, on this form, this is where you would list any care providers, clinics, hospitals. Um, anywhere where they've been getting care, just so we know or care about where they're getting care from. And then 
we have a similar checkoff for uh, any problems during this pregnancy mm -hmm. that, things that might come up. Um, yeah, anyone? I'm finding myself unsure of how much we want to go into detail about each one of these items or not, because it could get very long. <laughs> Well, I would recommend going through this if you haven't done this intake before and looking in heart and hands at these different sections. There you go. Even if you don't memorize it, like what's a big takeaway of like something you might want to ask as a follow-up question if they have any yeses to these. I mean, it's a good studying point, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That was the, that was the answer I was looking for. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is a good, really good studying, studying, study guide, honestly, um, for all of these issues. Yeah, Kathleen. Um, one thing, I mean, I, I appreciate that, I mean, it calls, it calls them, you know, problems. <laughs> Sometimes um, the like OBs will say, oh yeah, that's just part of pregnancy. Oh, you know, oh yeah, that's just, you know, and it's an opportunity to say, well, you know, because just because it's common <laughs> doesn't mean it's like normal or doesn't mean you have to have any of these things. Um, so an, an opportunity to you know, encourage them to seek additional, like, supports and dietary changes, or change simply, you know, like you said before, changing their toothbrush, or <laughs> to a softer bristle, or eating more bananas. Um, and having conversations, I think a lot, like, I appreciate also that it mentions about men the mental health aspects. Um, and it mentions it, I think, more than once. There might be another, like a couple other opportunities for that, but there've been a, a lot of really important conversations had. Um, and you may, you know, without the form, it may feel kind of, especially if you don't know, you know, you're only just meeting with them or you may feel hesitant if you're a new, newer doula or not a newer doula <laughs> um, to, be up front and ask some of the questions, but this definitely gives the opportunity to, to do that. And there are a lot of non-medical ways of supporting a lot of things, a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes this is also where um, the recommendations for like seeking like chiropractic or acupuncture care comes up like if you're really having a lot of back aches mm -hmm. or um yeah like that might that might be a sign that you know seeing a chiropractor that is that that um practices webster technique which is specific for pregnancy and postpartum um would be a good idea um, so yeah, that comes up. Um, I feel like a lot in this area. And there's a list of items that we ask about. It's so funny now that when I do this, when the, the viruses just feels different now, <laughs> like feels so much more loaded when I'm being in a pandemic, but we ask about, um, any of these possible exposures you might not have had. And then it gives us a chance to see like, oh, are you taking prenatal needles? Are you taking, are you feeling, you know, I mean, we asked about constipation up above, but sometimes it comes up with the, like, oh, you know, depending on the kind of, like if they're taking an iron supplement, is that constant constipation? Those things come up in the conversation. Helpful. Um, is 
So this, this, I think this questionnaire is a little bit different here to how it ends. This is the ending of it. Um, so it asks the questions, the mental health questions up here. There's the other one asked in a different place of people who are, um, who are not familiar with this form. Um, it, it asks all, like all the same things and a few more, but certainly. Um, it asks about work, like are you an active job, sedentary job. Um, asks about your partner. And then this is actually where then I kind of, this conversation, like what about your, about how you eat, leads into um, five finger eating and that conversation. Usually use it to lead into them. So that first session, we're doing the intake form and we're talking about five finger eating. Um, and, and then for exercise, it might even, for me, I might even either, depending on like what their needs, they have specific needs or whatnot, I might send them some resources, like a favorite of mine these days is the speed for them, gentle everyday practices from uh, spinning babies um, that I might send them. I might show them a video that feels like something they want at that time. Um, but definitely the big piece, I usually just end on their food and what their diet looks like so that we can lead into the conversation about five minutes. Anyone else have anything about this bit here? I, I'll go. Yeah. I, um, when I get to this part, I don't know, people always tense up about diet and stuff. So I was like, well, first of all, I'm not here to judge. It's not my job to judge. Don't even think that I'm here to judge you, okay? I might ask a question. You might feel uncomfortable, but it's not me being judgmental. I'm just trying to get some information. Um, and even then, they might be like, okay. But, but um, I just kind of always try to bring this part up. And then, and some more than often, what I find is that if you say, well, you know, what is your diet like? Oh, pretty healthy. Um, like, maybe not the best, but pretty healthy. <laughs> like, okay, well, like, what's a typical day like? <laughs> you know, what's a typical breakfast like or something like that? And, What'd like, you I had a today? client. Mm -hmm. That's what I always ask. What'd you eat today? Um, that gives you, that tends to be, give you a more specific idea about what, and then I go, oh, is that, you know, typical for you or what else do you know? And then I'll be like, well, actually I also tend to eat X, Y, and Z for breakfast also. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm considered. Yeah, you get people who say, oh, well, like I have smoothies. It's like, great. Um, and then like, oh, I'm having smoothies all day <laughs> throughout the day. <laughs> Yeah. Or oh, I just you know I just like cereal and then it's the all the sugary stuff. So mm -hmm. it it doesn't hurt to ask <laughs> so that because to them it might be as healthy as they can be, but you know it, it really might not be. So yeah. Um. Yeah, I would say oftentimes we're like the first person who's ever asked them about what they eat. Oh, whoa. okay. Ever talked, ever talked about it? They're like, oh yeah, yeah. My doctor's never, never said anything. My, <laughs> never said anything. Something I appreciate that Priscilla always emphasizes, and some sorry too, um, when starting it is really like, you know, I have a bunch of questions to ask, but also um, if there's anything you're not comfortable sharing, you know, you don't have to answer. Um, but it helps me, if, you know, if you do want to share, I appreciate it because it helps me provide better care for you. As I remember that when I was working with Priscilla, she's like, oh, we have to say, okay. <laughs> and I know Samsara always, you know, says that too. Um, the other thing about here, kind of about what their work and exercise 
It is an opportunity to promote getting a birth ball or yoga ball if they don't already have one <laughs> and encouraging them to sit on it and use it and exercise on it. Yep, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Such a simple thing. Yeah. That was helpful for them. Yeah. Anything else? Any questions that anyone has? I just sometimes I go back and look through it after the session because I'm trying to like listen and write down what they're saying and engage with them. And so it's helpful if like maybe even just before the next prenatal or right after that prenatal, I just do one more read through to like actually look at everything that we discussed and wrote down. I would add that our practice I know Jesslyn and Mika and well, and Julie too. There are people who are who are practicing without somebody there, but in the circle, what's really nice <laughs> is we were working with somebody. And so um, you can have, you know, you can both be asking the questions or you can have one person asking the questions and one person kind of like doing the note taking or you're both kind of taking notes and then to to go back and confer about it is really, really nice <laughs> and really useful. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so useful. It really is. I like that. And know that for anyone that's new in, in um, Kipper Circle, that you'll be watching us do it with clients. Um, We'll see how we do this first. Um, yeah. Any questions? You can, um, if you have your own copy of, well, you have this now because I put it in the WhatsApp group and you can it, download it, do whatever you want. Um, but definitely, I do highly suggest like what Jessalyn was mentioning is like kind of going through hearts and hands and looking um, at some of these conditions and how that might impact birth um, or what some of the suggestions might be here. Whatever, whatever it has to say about these topics. Super helpful. Um, it's part of like just your own studying and learning about all of this. And I, ho I really hope it comes across like why we do this um, with our clients and not just like, oh, I'll create a Google form for them to fill out or something, <laughs> or I'll just send it to them and they can send it back to me. That really, a big part of filling out this form is that developing your establishing your relationship with your client. So I, I cannot, you know, overemphasize the importance of that in this process. All right. Well, I am gonna let's see, I'm gonna stop share on this.